Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 42nd episode of Let's Talk Inclusion. I am Manubina Chakraborty, founder of uh, I for Inclusion. And uh, I'm delighted today to welcome all my dear colleagues to the 42nd episode of our Facebook Live, Let's Talk Inclusion, this evening. Oh, it's evening here in India, where uh, my friend Archana Garg and I am from. But uh, morning in the US, where my friends Therese Boshut and Inid Favor from, and afternoon in the UK and in uh, Nigeria, respectively, where my friends Tiffany James, Lola Ineke, and Blessing Ingepe are from. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Let's Talk Inclusion. So, Thank you. Before we formally begin, uh, if you all could say something about yourselves to our viewers. Tiffany, please. Hi, I'm Tiffany James. I am the vice president of NESI. And uh, I also work with a charity called the Dyslexia Trust, which is really my passion. Um, we are interested in bringing uh, qual quality teacher training to teachers about dyslexia um, and, and also giving scholarships to children who may not have the opportunity to um, have have one-on-one uh, -on -one or small group instruction from tutors uh, around the world, but mostly in the United Kingdom and uh, some, in, some in the US. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Uh, Lola, could you please say something about yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Lola Aneke, and I'm the executive director of Cadet Academy. Cadet Academy is an acronym for Comprehensive Autism and Related Disabilities Education and Training Academy. So that's Cadet Academy. And I'm also the founder of the nonprofit organization known as the Dew Drops Community Center for Special Needs. And what we do at both organizations is to provide educational support for children with, living with different disabilities under the Individuals with Disability Education Act in the US. So when you talk about children with dyslexia, Down syndrome, um, autism, emotional disturbances, we work, we provide educational support for these children. We train, we train teachers and also the parents to be able to support these children academically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lola. Uh, Therese, could you please say something about yourself now? Sure. I'm Therese Bosshart, and I am president of Empowering Steps. And what I do is help schools and parents and teachers learn about stress, emotions, and how to balance that to um, have their best, their best life. And I believe that everybody can have a chance and they have a choice and they all have abilities. We just have to help them bring it out. Very true. Very true. Thank you very much, Jules. Uh, Enid. Hello. Hi, I'm Enid. I'm from Silver Linings Education Services. And I also work very closely with Therese Bosshart. Uh, we have uh, developed what we call the Optimal Performance Blueprint, which we are very passionate about teaching about as well for understanding that kids need to be at their optimal performance to learn. So we, I work with kids and parents and advocates and around the country, and I'm so blessed to be able to work with so many wonderful colleagues and collaborate. So happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anid. Thank you for making it in the early morning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Blessing, could you please say something about yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Blessing Ngapi, and I am a dyslexia educator. I'm very passionate about teaching children with dyslexia and helping people acquire the basic skills that they need in helping these kids in school. And this led to me founding the organization called Dyslexia Help Africa, where we offer intervention for children with dyslexia. We create dyslexia awareness, and we help to empower educators, especially here in Nigeria, to get the necessary skills that they need to teach these children. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Blessing. And um, Archana has a very bad throat today. Uh, Archana, would you like to say something or uh, do you want me to say something about you? <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Archana is a rehabilitation psychologist affiliated uh, with the Rehabilitation Council of India. And uh, she has been a practitioner working hands-on with uh, students of diverse uh, abilities for over one and a half decades now. Right, Archana? And uh, she is basically uh, working for the vocational rehabilitation of uh, uh, neurodivergent uh, children and young persons. So uh, thank you very much, my dear friends. Uh, now I'm sure our viewers are eagerly waiting for our discussion again. Uh, the importance of alternative pathways in education is uh, our topic today. What do we mean by uh, alternative pathways? Uh, alternative pathways are uh, any learning activities which occur both inside and uh, outside of the scope of a formal education. If I put it in a simpler language, in the context of students with uh, uh, special educational needs, you can say that um, when a child or a young person is uh, unable to access mainstream school for reasons including school exclusion, behavioral issues or illness, education outside of school can help. And this can be called alternative pathways. Now my question to my esteemed colleagues here is, uh, should getting an academic qualification be the only goal in the life of a child who has a special or an additional educational need? What is your opinion, Tiffany? Uh, well, I think quality of life is not, not necessarily determined by qualifications. And so while qualifications may be the goal and may be intrinsically important to some individuals, for others it may not. And it really is dependent upon the, upon the child and the the family and the individual. So I would say no. Yeah, and uh, okay, I, I, I do uh, believe that too. And what is your opinion, you need? You need it. What do you think about it? Uh, well, there's, and I, you brought up an interesting pr uh, point when I was speaking to you earlier because I didn't realize even thinking of tutoring as an alternate pathway. Um, and so I think that we, I think the ultimate goal is for children to find their passion and whatever lights their fire. Yeah. And when we do that, it, it may lead them to a degree and it may lead them to being really happy in their life and feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's the ultimate goal. And so I, I brought up tutoring because I feel like I think what Tiffany's doing is so amazing with the foundation and so many of you all in, on this panel to try to make changes because kids shouldn't have to go to tutoring after school or on their summers, but they do because they need to, because reading, writing, and spelling is a necessity. So it, it is one of those things where it's it's a necessity for many children to have the extra services, but we need to not stop thinking about the fact that we need to find what lights their fire. Very true, thank you, thank you, Inid. And uh, I'm very curious to know what alternative learning pathways are being implemented in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, Lola, would you uh, like to say something about Nigeria in this regard? Okay. Um, for us in Nigeria, um, the alternative pathway that is most common is the vocational skills. And um, of course, there are few because we're very close to the UK. Um, we were colonized, Nigeria was colonized by the UK. So most times, some of the alternative um, um, educational pathway that you find individuals here um, gearing towards would be, um, there's a particular program called the ASDAN and the full meaning of that is um, the award scheme um, development and accreditation network. And personally, I found out about that when I was thinking of what other pathways would be uh, beneficial to, to our children living with special needs because of obvious reasons apart from interest, which is very important, um, IQ level and um, several other factors. You know, I was thinking, and because in this part of the world, in Nigeria, we are very big on certification. So even if you find someone who's very good with um, um, tailoring, for example, or good with 
hairdressing, for example, they're going to ask him, so where do you get trained and do you have these qualifications? Even the person is so hands on and so skilled at it. So we find ourselves in that middle whereby even with the fact that vocational skills are oh, they are very good, I think one of the challenges we're having is the fact that we don't have a, a, a particular curriculum that says, okay, when you go through the vocational school for like a year or two or three, then you get a form of diploma to say, look, you're qualified to do this. We are not there yet to work towards that, but um, we, I realize that beyond every other form of vocational uh, skills that we call them, adopt and we're adopting um it's not very well embraced it's not very well accepted if it's not with a diploma you know so as that is one that i realize a few um individuals and in schools here uh, um gary towards and the amazing thing about as that is that it's been a, it's actually international so if, if you're qualified if you are um a member or you're you're, you're given approval to run the program you can actually do that if, if a friend sister was the first person that I saw with Asda, and she's actually into um, hotel and um, hospitality, and she's doing so very well with it. She's actually dyslexic, and then she was struggling at some point, and then they had to fly her to the UK to do that. And for me, I'm like, why not? You know. So I think vocational skills, if we can put it as, if we can get a curriculum together and have a proper way of running it, is very popular here in Nigeria. And then several other programs, but Asda is the most popular one. Okay, okay. So nice to know that if we have a, a kind of similar scenario here in India, and I'd like my uh, friend Archana to say something about it. But later on, um, uh, yeah, because Ar Archana had a bad throat, she sent a message to me just now. Give me some time. <laughs> so, what is it like in um, the US, uh, Teresa? And in India, if you would like to uh, throw some light on this. Well, I, I am agreeing uh, with Lola, the vocational information we have here, we have plenty of vocational schools. Um, I think they concentrate, we have specialty schools as well. And I'm noticing a lot of the high schools that I work with, they will send children to learn specific needs within a high school. And the whole district might have mm, four high schools and one will be primarily for math and science, and another one will be for gift, and another one will be for, um, you know, a different group. So it's quite lovely that we do service those needs. Uh, also, the monies here sometimes for education will go to those different programs if they can prove to be worthy. So um, it's definitely helpful. Um, I think also Enid might have some more input on legislature and really causing the schools to take a look at these items and making sure that we meet these children's needs um, because we're all different whether it's you know a very academic person or someone that is neurodiverse and maybe has an aptitude in another area we need to meet those needs. We can't just keep education going the way it's been for 50 years because we're just not there anymore. We don't, um, it won't serve the, the, the children's needs and then it won't help them become adults that can be functioning in society, you know, sure. so. Yeah. And I wanted to say one thing about what Teresa was saying is it's a spectrum from what Laurel, Lola said to what Teresa said in that what Teresa is explaining is the perfect scenario, which does happen in certain places in the United States. But there's still, I'm amazed. I worked with a student the other day and I, she said, I really want to do law, but I don't want to take the bar or go through law school. And I said, did you know there's a thing called a paralegal? She's like, no. So it was interesting because we, we don't help these students find those things that maybe they could be good at. And Lola brought up a really interesting point because I used to walk into third grade classes and say, that's going to be your hairdresser. That's going to be your mechanic. That's going to be your, you know, your builder. That's going to be your, you can tell at third grade where maybe they're, you know, where they maybe, you know, their, their interests lie. And I feel like at third grade, we could be working on helping them, you know, find their place and helping them um, find their alternate pathways. But we're not doing that. I think that's a weakness across education. I don't think we're helping children realize that there are alternate pathways and that finding their alternate pathway. And so even at our high schools, I've been, I have high school students and I'm blown away that they don't get uh, support in finding their career path. 
and that I would think that they did like I did when I was in school. So it's definitely what Trace describes is there. It's, it's the ideal, um, but we have that spectrum. Thank you. Uh, I have something in the comment section. Uh, my friend Sri Priya, who is based in London and an inclusion expert, has uh, written something. Instead of calling it alternative pathway, can we not call it parallel pathway? That way we can slowly take away the stigma and even those who have undiagnosed needs, undiagnosed needs can access it. It's very, very... I agree. On represent, agree, agree, agree. <laughs> yeah. So do I. So do I. And one more comment from Mr. Priya. I wish more UK schools would access as done. As done? Maybe as done? Yes, uh, as done. It's a like a... Sorry, as done. That was an uh, alternative, sorry, parallel pathway program. I said we, that's quite common in Nigeria. It's actually the, the full meaning is award scheme development and accreditation network. It's a foundation that has been able to uh, understand neurodiversity of individuals and being able to put them into specific skills. And I think it's quite interesting because the, the first time I found out about that, I was really wowed and it's actually working because it provides beyond just the, the ability to do what you love to do and you are, you are taught to do and on and um, repeatedly, it also gives you a diploma where you can actually get a job with that. Okay, okay. Uh, it's a blessing. Would you like to add something to it? Yes, thank you. I, I totally agree with the last comment that I spoke about it being a parallel pathway because I was thinking that this is not uh, a thing just for children with special needs, that this should actually be the basics for education. And I can give a clear example of this. For someone who is not a you know, special need individual in our music. So, of course, here in, in Africa, I think it's everywhere. You have to go through primary education, go through your secondary education and get a degree before you can even think of working. But he has always been passionate about music. So he got into his primary education, into the secondary education. But while he was getting into the tertiary institution, he was expecting that he will get to learn about just music. But then you have to learn what we call the GST courses, other courses that don't have to do with music. And he did so, so bad with those courses that he had to leave school. And you know, as, a, uh, uh, as an African country, you know, everybody was like, you have to finish your school and get your degree before you think about music. But right now, yes, it's out of the degree part, but he's focused on his path, which is music. And he's doing amazingly well. So I think this is a pathway that is not just for children with special needs, but it should be a pathway for everyone. We should let people find their path. And like Coach Lola mentioned, there should be a certification for these um, institutions that shows that, yes, you may not have gotten a degree, but you're certified, you know, to carry out this particular skill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Blessing. Uh, now, when uh, Shripriya was talking about stigma, uh, something came in my mind, and because Turis is uh, working for emotional self-regulation. Yes, my question to you is how would you guide parents and of course, of course students who might opt for uh, this alternative or we should say parallel pathways because of school exclusion? Well, I think, you know, uh, Tiffany had mentioned someone in the, in the beginning and um, we really need to find out the child's goals. What are the child's goals? And we really need to focus on finding out their triggers and their trauma because a child cannot learn um, if they have something called cortical inhibition. And that comes in when they get very nervous or upset because someone's making them read and they don't feel they can read. Or from, from a life experience at five years old when someone told them they were no good. You can't behave, you can't sit down, you can't whatever. Um, and so this sits in their head and it causes 
it causes emotional distress and that shuts down their system. So we need to teach them how to be flexible. We need to teach all the, the, um, the teachers, the counselors on how to calm this particular emotional part down so that these children at that point are ready to learn and they can retrieve information from the brain. The cortical inhibition actually does not allow them to pull information that they've just learned. So they, you can sit there and, and we've been told over and over that these children can't remember anything. Well, the reason they can is they're in a panic and they cannot, they cannot get to that information, even though they know it. And everybody has a threshold. I'm not very good at, at um, remembering math numbers. And, and everybody, and like Blessing mentioned, everybody has a, a different pathway and we're all individuals. And I think we really need to recognize that. But once you teach an individual how to calm down that emotion, they can sync up with their brain and then they can move forward. It's, it, I've seen it, I've been doing it 20 years, it's amazing. And um, it's been in, actually put into many schools here. So just teaching that to everybody so everybody knows how to calm the situation down beside, instead of making it crazy. And then you have cortical inhibition and you cannot retrieve information. So that's, and I think the alternative pathways show these children, yes, there's a different way. And you're not different in that you can succeed just as anyone else. But it needs to be the child's goals, not the parent's goals. And I think that's very important. And as I don't, somebody else mentioned, we need Olola, hairdressers, we need mechanics, who's going to fix our cars? We need, you know, this is a, a functioning society needs all of these people. And we need to give them the confidence to say, yes, this is a great thing to do. And thank you for doing that. Yeah, very true. No. So these are very small things, but often ignored. And right. uh, I love your inputs, uh, Therese. And I have always benefited from your inputs. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And what, what role uh, does the legislation uh, play in different countries? Uh, uh, we can start with the U.S. and different states. Are you both from the same state? No. No. Uh, in India. So no, what I'm... are the roles of the um, different uh, states, legislation, I, I, say. I mean, I, I mean, I would say there's not really any that supports um, parallel, I mean, parallel pathways as in terms of what we're talking about supporting kids at an early age you know Therese brings up the fact that we want that we should follow children's goals however children don't even know what's out there to be a goal so I feel like you know my one of my colleagues said do you remember when we used to have career day in high school when they would bring all the careers and we could go and talk to all the people and decide what we wanted to do and I said no, that sounds brilliant we should always do that but if we did that in third grade and help these kids sort of start to find their passion and find their interests and find what you know they're interested in um i think that would be and i don't it, i i think it's interesting that you bring up legislation manabina because i think this is something we don't talk about we don't talk about parallel pathways very often not in the us we don't we talk that we you know we, we really do push kids to go through school and you know you're going to graduate and you're going to go to college um we don't talk about the trades we really don't so it's something that i feel is extremely lacking in our country in terms of we are, you know, real big on reading, writing and spelling and math and history and that. But we have taken music and art and, you know, uh, PE and the things that are going to help children find their passions um, pretty much out of school. So I would say that if legislation were to I mean, this is something we, we, this is great to talk about because we need legislation in these areas. And I would say bring back art, music and PE and the things that are going to help people, you know, find what they're interested in. Because what Teresa, what Teresa talks about is that. We, when they're in cortical inhibition and they're feeling that they can't do anything right, they need to find something they can do right. And if they can find something they can do right, that can put them in a state of cortical facilitation. I mean, I can take kids sometimes who are completely breaking down during the reading, writing, and spelling, and we color or we draw for a minute and we bring them back into that cortical facilitation. And then all of a sudden they feel like there's it's something they're good at, you know, or some kids hate drawing. We're not going to do that. You know, we're going to find that thing that they're passionate about and try to bring that in so that they can feel that feel good about something and have that cortical facilitation that Therese talks about. So without feeling good about yourself and feeling good about something, it's really, it. all you have is that 
looping thought of, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do anything right. And, and, you know, we're um, running a clinical research study and we take a, a negativity self-esteem rating scale at the beginning. And it is so sad. These kids have really high home self-esteem and really low school self-esteem, but if they, and they have high self-esteem because mom and dad are like, you can do it. You can do it. You're doing it. Oh, you're really good at that. And you're really good at that. And they go to school and they're not good at anything. So I, I would say, Bring back the things that allow kids to shine in different areas than reading, writing, and math and all the academics. Well, in the creative parts of, I mean, math is directly related to music. I mean, you know, that is just a different perspective, right? So you learn math through music rather than doing math on a board. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, we have to deal, we have to learn to show different perspective and different ways of learning for each individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do have, they have tax money and stuff that they are putting in Arizona into alternative pathways. So it, it is helpful. Okay. Well, that's good here. <laughs> and I'm not saying there isn't legislation. There probably is. I don't know about it. And I deal a lot with the, with the uh, educational laws here. So I'm saying there are probably some states that are, like Therese said, they're coming up with funding for it. But as a country, we're lacking tremendously yeah, in this great. area. Yep, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for your inputs. Now, Tiffany, you have worked in both in the US as in the UK. Uh, what would you like to say about this? What is your opinion about it? Well, there, I, I, I do see there's quite a difference in the educational systems between the UK and, and the US. And uh, one thing I think the UK does well is uh, children tend to specialize in areas that, uh, that are of interest to them quite young. and by the time they are about 14, you know, they, they've already narrowed it down to the subjects that are most of interest to them. Now, I'm not going to say that these two, all the children are going are have um, su sufficient reading skills because that part is still lacking. The early reading skills and giving these children equal opportunity at, at, for later attainment is, is, is not great here, just like it isn't most most all over the world. So you still have a lot of children, especially dyslexic kids that are not getting what they need early. But later, I do think the UK does a pretty, a, a better job of, of um, narrowing down the focus. So uh, these kids, if they go at 16, they can go on to um, what we call college and they, they can study hairdressing or building or, or um, some other some other trade or something else that might be of interest to them, or they can study uh, for their A levels in preparation for going to university later. So that, that's a that's that's a real difference between the two. But I want to go back to something that um, that Enid said is we need to help them when they're young. Ha what lights their fire? I love the way she put that. That that is absolutely the truth. And and to me that's tutoring 101. When these kids come in, they are defeated. Their self esteem is is is. Is, has, has been crushed often, has been crushed. And we need to help them find, um, some of them already know, uh, and, and just don't put any value on, on these other things because they've been taught to believe, well, reading in school is the only thing that's important. But these kids are not getting what they need at school and it's often really hard and really crushing. So they need to have that outside of school, that time to explore the things that they're good at, whether it's sports or art or music or building or, whatever it is that, that they're good at. They need to have that time just for the, them themselves, for their self-esteem. So important. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, that, that's actually the most important thing in self-esteem. And uh, how is it like in Nigeria, uh, Lola and Blessing? Oh, I laugh because um, if the US and the UK is struggling, then we're also struggling with that. Um, but one interesting thing that when everybody else was speaking for me is that I remember that for every change, when it comes to legislation, it starts with advocacy like this, starts with the parents and everybody's speaking up because the truth is that reality is different from um, what we see. So what I, mean that, what I mean by that is that we are the ones that see these children. We are the, uh, the parents are the ones that know their unique strength and the pathway that would work for them. But that's a different ballgame from what the legislative bodies is saying. So, but if we keep talking about it, if we keep making sense from it, 
if parents keep um, advocating, then we'll change the narrative. Now, I'll share very good news with you. While I was speaking about what it is here in Nigeria and how we're, we're trying to, I mean, we are hoping that beyond using the foreign, um, the ASTAN, which is working for us, can we create something that would be indigenous and would work for us as, as a country? And the cherry news is that just in April, during Autism Awareness Month, um, a senior colleague who's also, who happens to be a mentor, she has a son um, who is living with autism and is, is, is about 18 or 19, if I'm not very far from, the, from his age right now. And the interesting about this is that this mother is a school, she's a school owner, she has a school, and she knows, she understands what learning um, differences and interests. She has a, a, a sense of children with autism. So she has seen a child display all that we're talking about, about parallel learning. And um, what she, she took it upon herself to set up a school which she had named um, the Learning Innovation Academy. And for me, that's a great movement. And then what, what does she do about that? She understands the place of, um, you know, we having a certificate of how people will be stigmatized or looked down upon if you do have something to show that I, I may not have gone through the, the regular um, tertiary institution, but then I'm good with music. And the, the amazing thing about our child, our son is, when she realized that he was very good with music, she got him a music coach. And um, by the time he was 18, he has his own band that he leads. So they have the guitarist, they have, they have his manager. And then every time, that every festive season is fully booked. When I mean fully booked, he has, so they call him up, it's engaged for jams, I know. And you, he does it so well and effortlessly. Like, you'll be amazed as a, how he plays the keyboard. Now she's thinking, um, yeah, my son might be so good. And I hope I'm telling the story right. <laughs> she's thinking, my son might be so good. But then if he needs to go play somewhere in um another country what are what would they be looking out for what are the cards what criteria would they be looking out for and then she took it a step for um ahead by creating the school which you could go check, check it out online i'll send you the uh, instagram and i'll share it after speaking it's called the learning innovation academy in lagos and it's start the, uh, the a school for talented new diverse youth and adults and what do they do there? They do a create, it's about creativity. If you're into, if you're cool with drama, you don't need to study any other thing, but they'll focus you on drama for a certain number of years. And then if you're good with um art, then you go ahead and do that. Just the person was saying that um the person she was talking about was confused. I, said, I wasn't good at math, why would they make me do math in some other subject? And then if you're good in science and technology, so it's like a monotechnic, so they're going that way. And then she imagine our launching that, and we had the Minister of Education present there. We had um, you know, dignitaries and all of those people there. There's no way our legislative our, our laws will not start thinking about that. So as we as for me, the answer to that question, it might not be there yet, but the move she had made, what we're talking about today, advocates will begin to the, the lawmakers begin to think about that. that because the truth is that. Most of them know that that is it, but if we don't make that move and show them that it's, show them that it's possible, then we keep talking and think, oh, when will things change for neurodiverse individuals? So that's just a good news for me. And and I think, I mean, for every change, even in this next world, in every world, parent advocacy begin to change the narrative. So that's our own Nigerian success story. And I believe that there'll be more coming up in relation to that. Okay. Yes, I, I totally you know, do agree with Lola, especially when she spoke about the advocacy, because I believe that's where it starts from. It starts with us as teachers and then parents. I'm super excited about that parent because when, uh, I think one of us here mentioned about the importance of, of course, we need carpenters, we need um, people who will help with our cars and all of that. But then even parents see some of those things as demeaning, especially here in Africa. Like, I remember one of one of my students wants to be a DJ, and the parents are like, <laughs> they are hoping and wishing that it's just a childhood fantasy, because how can you want to be a DJ? You understand? Why would you want to be a carpenter? Why would you want to be an electrician? Why not be an engineer, you know, and all of that? So yes, it has to start with the advocacy. Parents need to, first of all, accept that it is okay 
for my child to be a carpenter, it is fine. If my child wants to be a DJ. And then teachers also need to know that this is very important because in schools, we hear teachers make examples like if you don't pass your exams well, you're going to end up on the streets repairing people's cars. You're going to end up as a carpenter. You're going to end up as this. So a lot of advocacy needs to be done to help the legislative parts to push forward. And I guess this is across all countries, not just here yeah. in Nigeria or Africa. It's similar in India as well. And India has a, a very rigid degree system. And there is very limited awareness about uh, parallel pathways. Uh, the pathways other than the conventional ones, as you said. And uh, we have an open schooling system in place. And there are provision for... Uh, school certificates as well as vocational qualifications. But sadly, the awareness is and acceptance. Both are very, very low. Okay. And Archana being her re rehabilitation psychologist often uh, plans vocational rehabilitation for students who have additional needs. I will come to you now, Archana. How is your throat now? Will you be able to speak, Archana? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> Let's okay. see. So, uh, Archana, what role can vocational training play in a student's life, especially who is differently abled? Yeah. Thank you, Manopina. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Supriya for adding this beautiful... Uh, Supriya. Supriya. Supriya, okay. Yeah. This panel... Uh, pathways okay so we know that students have many different learning styles okay and in recent years educators have come to recognize that each person has unique uh, mode of learning so resources and techniques are now available to meet individual needs so although some people find it easy to learn through traditional teaching methods and other require strategies and techniques which are more closely suitable to their unique learning styles if the needs of the students are to be met and if they are to become a productive member of the society, then priorities must shift from content-centered programs to student-centered programs, right? Mm -hmm. So emphasis must be placed on students' strengths, students' choices, their aptitudes, and programming should be designed to meet the students' needs, not the needs of the school or any particular system. So when we talk about the vocational education, then basically uh, special school programs will emphasis on basic developmental skills, communication skills, and adaptive behavior. But, but <clears throat> vocational training involves teaching people to acquire a particular skill, which is designed to pr prepare them for a particular occupation. OK? So persons with difficulties, uh, employment is considered as a vital step towards their rehabilitation and empowerment in that it provides a sense of belongingness and mm -hmm. sense of independence and it increases their social inclusion also, as we know, and overall well-being. So in traditional education, the main focus is on teaching and learning of theoretical materials. But in vocational education, focus is on learning and teaching of practical knowledge and uh, Vocational education also makes the person job ready. That is my opinion. I love that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Archana. And there is a question uh, by uh, one of our um, senior colleagues, uh, Mrs. Vijaya Prakash. She's a very uh, well-known inclusion expert in uh, Mumbai. Are the alternative parallel or parallel pathways introduced to all children in the mainstream schools? Or do kids give up academics and choose the alternative or parallel pathway? I think she's talking about vocational here, vocational trainings here. So what is your opinion, friends? Uh, yeah, you need, please. Oh, are you starting with me? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Um, can somebody else start for a second? Sorry, I was, I'm was i still thinking about it. Uh, okay. Well, I was, well, before we came on, on board, I had the same question in mind, and um, I did a little bit of research, and um, my take, and my, my, from my research I did, it's 
uh, there are several factors that would determine that. So um, I remember looking through when I was doing my research and we we're talking about issues like identification of what are the challenges? Is it, um, does it have to do even with just not special needs? Could it be a socioeconomic background of the child? And uh, what are the opportunities for this child? It does it have to do with um, cognitive abilities? What kind of assessments would be done and at what age do we do those assessments so that we can determine for sure if this child can go further or this child will be needing a parallel, um, uh, parallel, sorry, parallel pathway. And then also the interest of the child, you know, I'll give an example and I'm not saying, and also based on what um, Tiffany was saying about um, reading proficiency and reading skills and where, you know, where, so for example, my child, my daughter, this, well, I could, in fact, I was doing a research today, look, is gymnastic an alternative uh, or parallel pathway because my daughter is so in love with gymnastic and she would know the days she'll ask you i have to wiggle my way out if i'm not up to it it's like i'm i'm committing a crime if i don't take her for a price and she loves it's like when you when she's there it's like you have put her in like when you put a fish in water she's just she stops she doesn't my daughter doesn't stop at gymnastic when it has ended she stops when she's and they all know when she's ready to stop so i'm thinking hmm she's good academically also and I'm thinking, I want her to follow because this is a natural, this is who she is naturally, you know. And that for me also asks, answers that question. It's about we understanding where and when and identifying the strength of this child. And like I, like I was mentioning what Tiffany said earlier on about, so at what point, even if the child has got some form of uh, learning challenges, at what point do we say, this, guy, this child is proficient enough? For example, trade, trade schools are also vocational schools. What skills? Would they be requiring at what age do we determine when to introduce it and when to have an assessment to say okay this is the way to go right now and this alpha because of course we want to avoid frustration we want to avoid um them struggling and you know getting confused and at the same time also fighting the way the battle of stigmatization of, oh you're going to be an auto automobile engineer sounds very um highly pleased but a, a roadside mechanic or a, a, a carpenter you know but dignity in all that we're saying and helping them celebrate whatever they find useful or they find themselves enjoy doing so i don't think there's an answer to that but we need to find um the balance that's my own take and that's the question now that's where i find myself with my child and okay really, I was, uh, oh sorry i was gonna say it was ready to share but I wouldn't, i'm sorry i just wanted to share something really quick um i had a total moment of cortical inhibition right there and that's why i wanted to share sorry just in that moment because i with my dyslexia i was trying to process the question as manavina was reading it and i couldn't process it in that moment so i just want to share because here i'm on this panel and i'm you know i really just had a moment of my with my dyslexia and the cortical inhibition and i'm able to bring myself right back and be very enthralled in lola's um answer and get myself right back and, and be able to process it so i just wanted to share that real quick that that i was having that moment as our kids do all day long and um i'd like to make a comment Thanks quick. Sharing. Um, <laughs> yeah. lola that that example that you gave is perfect because it's very important here sometimes they've taken out gym we call gym or physical education mm -hmm. and these children sit there all day people just you and i it's the same mm -hmm. thing and we get this adrenaline and this cortisol and it raises and it raises in our system that gymnastics for your daughter just releases all that and brings mm -hmm. her back to balance so the nervous system when we have um cortical inhibition is flooded with adrenaline and cortisol. So when you were able to, when she goes and does this, she feels release. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of sports, um, I know oftentimes we'll get kids and I'm sure Tiffany can speak to this and I know Enid does, but if they're, if they're just sitting there not paying attention, if they get up and run around the room and sit back down or Enid mentioned coloring, um, and I think everyone here is experienced with that, that we have just and that's the physical body trying to normalize and balance something that's gone a little bit off. That's all it is. So that gymnastics and, and sports and any kind of movement for children is very important. So um, it's like an instinct. She loves it. She's good at it. And and I we just need to keep finding that for the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Blessing you. I wanted to say something. 
Okay, yes, yes, yes. I totally agree with what Coach Lola said. And I wanted to point out that that's exactly why I'm sure we're preferring the name parallel to alternative because it is going hand in hand. They don't have to drop their education because they are good with something. And Coach Lola also mentioned some factors. So if those factors come in and the child has to stop schooling at some base, at um, a particular point in, you know, in their life, then it's totally fine. But, you know, there's no one answer to that. It has to do with the factors surrounding that. But most importantly, we need to understand that it is power. So it doesn't mean I'm going to have an education, then I'm not going to build my skills. Or if I'm building my skills, I'm not going to have an education. They can go, they can go hand in hand, except in a situation whereby the factors are going to be otherwise. Yeah, very true, very true. And um, now, what do you think as neurodiversity advocates and advocates of these uh, parallel pathways, uh, what can we do to spread awareness about uh, these pathways uh, to make the education system more inclusive? Can we do something globally, Tiffany? Well, calling it parallel, I, I, it is a, it is a, a, a wonderful idea. I love the way that she put that, because at listening to all of the uh, women on the panel speak, I think there's a theme that runs through, uh, and a thread that runs through is that there's some sort of um, uh, it, it's a, a cultural shame in in choosing these these other types of these other types of careers. So I. I it's hard to understand how we could legislate against that. I, I think it's a cultural thing. I think we need to change the belief system. And like you said, awareness that um, th these these types of occupations are important and uh, they help uh, make the world go round, you know, these and, and they should be valued. And um, and again, going back to oh, the, the, the comment was lovely. And you know, do do children choose this because it's the only thing that, that's of offer to them because they failed first? or is it introduced to them in the beginning? I think from my perspective, it's usually the second thing. The mm -hmm. second explanation is they failed at academics and then they're giving this as some kind of a second best. Well, you're not good enough for academics, so this is what you're going to get. So that's unfortunate as well. And that's also cultural, believing that every child needs to have a uh, university degree it, to have some value uh, in society. Is, is, it just isn't, just isn't true. And I, I will tell you, uh, you know, we're just a, a small company of, of 30 or 40, empl 40 employees or something, but we don't, Mike and I do not require uh, a degree to, um, to work at our company. It, uh, we, we're looking for skills and we're looking for passion and we're looking for a willingness and um, interest in learning and they can have a degree or don't have a degree. And um, just anecdotally, the, the, we, we haven't seen a difference in the quality of work or the quality of the individual from those who have degrees and those that don't. And sometimes they come to us with, with English degrees, uh, even uh, uh, master's degrees in English, and um, they, they can't write anyway. So, so we have to uh, re retrain them in, in some of the basics. So it's not a requirement for us. It never has been and it never will be as long as we're at the helm of, of this company. We're looking for something else. And there are lots of uh, people, especially because we have lots of dyslexic in our company, that although they have the intellectual ability or the IQ to earn a, to earn a degree, if they had had the right support, uh, they often didn't have that opportunity because of the educational system that they were kind of constrained within and uh, feeling defeated. And, and all, there are all kinds of things that kept them from going on to higher education, but that doesn't make them any less capable for us. So... It's a different, uh, but I know that it's unusual, um, and and most companies are saying that they 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 want a degree before they'll even speak to you. Right, and and I think, yeah, and that's perfect, Tiffany. That was so well spoken. In the United States, a college degree now can be cost prohibitive. Yeah, and there, and you know that as well. <laughs> and so now they come out and they can't they can't make that money up, and they have this huge debt. I mean, there is, there's a real disconnect there. And I had a client and he was great in science and math, but was very creative and dropped out of college and um, went on to work at Disney as a creative director and is doing wonderful things without a college degree. Still good at science, still good at math, 
but went to get trained in this particular area and is thriving. So again, promoting that type of thing with each individual um, and helping them go along with their, with their goal and their drive. You know, somebody I asked me once if, if, why are there so many dyslexic entrepreneurs? And of course, I don't think we know the answer to that. But my question back to them was, is uh, it is the fact that so many of these people had their doors closed to them and opportunities closed to them that mm -hmm. the only way to make money to support their family or, or and, and do what they needed to do was to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Is that part of the is that part of the reason? So it would be interesting well, to study that and find out. Yeah. And I bring up a good point, too, as far as um, in terms of um, for individuals, are they finding their um, passion? Uh, you know, it's so important that one thing I just want to say real quick, so I'm trying to get all my thoughts because there's so much that came to me today. I had so many epiphanies. Um, we've had a real controversy in the U.S. about learning styles and learning um, how we learn differently. And it's actually a controversy right now. Um, and so you brought up great points in that that we so we've gotten and the reason why it's a controversy in the u.s is because the um just we go from one end of the spectrum to the other the pendulum swings so far over and so far over so for a while there we were only teaching kids to their learning styles and so they said that's not good we can't like so if we said they're visual we would only teach them visual or we would give them you know and so many and tiffany correct me if i'm wrong on on what the controversy is but it, so for because we did it so intensely, then we say that research said, no, that's not the best way. But I think we've lost track of the fact that we do have different learning styles and we do need to. And that's kind of what Teresa was just saying in terms of, um, you know, this this individual went to Disney because they had a passion for gaming. That was in their, their learning style followed that that path. And so I think it's it's it, the controversy of learning styles has maybe taken us away from the value of learning styles, in my opinion. And it's just teaching to the individual, isn't it? You know, people are exactly. individuals. Exactly. And it, it's not. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, you know, an, an academic classification of th this is a kinesthetic learner and this is this. You exactly. know, because there is a lot of, of controversy about that, and um, it, it it just it, it think of think of children as 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 individuals. They're not all going to. Uh, receive it the same way for many different reasons. And and what it is, yeah, so it's so important that we allow them to be, you know, experience and find out what their learning style is. I guess that's the point too, is that um, with what Archana was saying is that it's, you know, helping them figure out what, how they learn best. And so we've kind of gotten away from that. And so the other epiphany was, and Tiffany brought this up, we really need to look at the whole child. And I, I, I started thinking as everyone was talking, Everybody's talking about the science of reading. We've got to get these kids reading. But maybe we're missing everything here because we're focusing so much on the academics, the science of the academics. How do we teach these kids to read? We have to do this and follow this program and do this. And what methodology are we using? But then in all of that, we lose the whole child. And I think we just have to get back to focusing on the whole child. And 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 that means what makes them feel good about themselves, what makes them um you know, all of, all of these things are so important that everybody mentioned today to come full circle to really just say we need to focus on the whole child. Uh, Enid, and I know I'm taking up a lot of time, so I'll, I'll no, I feel my, the same way. Sorry, <laughs> but Enid may feel that may, may feel the same way. I mean, anecdotally, uh, tutoring 101, you know that when the child comes in, um, they're almost always crushed, uh, emotionally crushed, their self esteem mm -hmm. is crushed. But the first thing that you have to do is kind of build that back up and help them build a little bit of confidence, and then also teaching them that there is value in the other things that they're good at. That's all part of tutoring. Mm -hmm. So no matter what uh, curriculum you're using or, or methodology you're using, um, your good tutors are just that to, to the child anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say it because it sounds cliche, but there just isn't a one size fits all uh, way of, of doing it. Um, that, you know, we know some, we know there are lots, lots of things that work better because we have science that shows that this works better and this works better, but you still need to look at the, the kiddo and see what, what works for them and the family, mm -hmm. the family as well. Oh, thank you very much. And Mrs. Vijay Prakash has um, sent one more comment. It's for you, Tiffany. All the different schools, mainstream vocational sports and arts and so on have to collaborate effectively for the sake of children. Sure. I, I agree with that completely. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it just goes back to saying that again. It's not one size fits all, is it? We're not not every not every child is is uh, destined or or should be. Uh, we shouldn't be turning out just a whole classroom full of accountants. You know, we need some accountants, but we also need some artists and we need some builders and we need um, exactly. some sports people and we need we need people good at all kinds of things. It, it's yeah. it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and, you very uh, much. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, uh, yeah. This yeah, guy. Yeah. We should uh, we should start uh, pre vocational uh, training at early age actually, so that we can know the strength and the interest of the child, so that uh, we can work on that. Apart from academics, we should work on pre vocational training also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wait, because Archana is working on all this. Archana provides rather plans, life skills, and pre-vocational trainings from the um, primary school age, uh, school age actually. So she knows this uh, better, right, Archana? Much better than me. <laughs> so thank you very much, ladies, uh, for coming to this um, talk show, Let's Talk Inclusion today. And um, as I was uh, saying earlier, we have completed two years in I for Inclusion. And for viewers, uh, all of us are the founding members of I for Inclusion. And uh, without the help of this um, uh, gorgeous colleagues of mine, I couldn't have done anything. And Let's Talk Inclusion uh, would have been a dream for me and uh, thank you very much for this so before we um, uh, wind up today uh, your concluding comments uh, all of you let's start with the um, youngest one blessing <laughs> <laughs> okay um First, I want to say congratulations to all of us. We're two years, yeah. And then I think the next thing after now is to implement everything we've just said here. For those listening to us, in what areas can you implement it in your community? And then to all of us here too, which I believe we're already doing in uh, various platforms. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Arshina. Would uh -huh. like to say something or bad throat? Yeah. No, no, I'll say, I'll say I would like to say thank you to you, Manobina, for, for providing this platform for all of us. And uh, I am learning a lot from all these beautiful ladies. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. And I still remember first I contacted Tiffany and asked for her help. And Tiffany then put me uh, in contact with uh, Enid first, and then Tiris, and then Blessing, and then Lola. Mm -hmm. And finally, I approached you, and uh, we joined hands together to uh, create this global platform. And we are, um, yes, still running the show, strong with our heads uh, high, right? Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for all to all of you for uh, all this. Tiffany, thanks a lot. Would you like to say something? I just want to say thank you for creating this, this global platform and educating the world. You're doing a great service for children and uh, families globally. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I need to. That's what I'd like to say as well. I'm just so grateful to be included in, in, in this wonderful group of ladies. And uh, today was especially special. I've watched um, so many of your panels and but to to be here today with all of you and hear this and have this message be out there it's not being really talked about very much um, I think so many other things get talked about and this gets lost so thank you so much everybody for contributing and just I've learned so much today it's such a, such a blessing thank you very much Amy and uh, Therese I just want to again reiterate the thank you I'm very grateful to be included on this and I want everyone to think about um, the collaboration and then we all want to belong. We want the children mm -hmm. to feel that they belong to something, are, are a real part of this world. So I appreciate it. Thank you and I'm grateful and constantly learning from all of you as well. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Therese. Lola. Thank you, super amazing team. I'm glad I'm a member of this team. Congratulations to us. Uh, I think my parting word would be uh, the saying that goes, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to exhibit that in Eye for Inclusion. And 
as inclusion advocate, as inclusion expert, as classroom teachers, as parents. Let's always remember not to leave any child behind, irrespective of any ability. I just use what ability status. So remember, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So if you decide to leave the, weak, the weakest link, then we we'll all get broken. So let's keep ourselves together. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for coming to this program today. And uh, um, I look forward to having you over soon. Uh, it's been a long time this time, but uh, yes, we will meet soon. And um, uh, to our viewers, thank you very much for uh, supporting us for all these two years. And um, uh, please keep an eye on our Facebook page for the 43rd announcement of the 43rd episode of Let's Talk Inclusion soon. Until then, take very good care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, friends. Bye-bye.